morning, everybody. I have my mic on now, so you ought to be able to hear me. <laughs> you know, it, uh, it is quite nerve wracking or mind depressing. I married into a family that uh, is quite an unusual family. Mary has seven brothers and sisters that make them eight children in the family. They all were pretty much the same way that I am. They like to jerk around and have a great time. But there's only two left now. Her younger sister and her younger brother. I was accepted into the family as one of their siblings. I am actually closer to their family than I was to my own family. So when we went down last Monday to visit the home, the uh, hospice house, it was quite heartbreaking. Tuesday we got the word that she had passed away and we went down Friday night and then Saturday for the you know, I almost, I'll be honest with you, I almost called a friend of mine saying, will you preach for me Sunday? <laughs> because I really did not have time to uh, sit down and work for a sermon. How many of you were born and raised in West Virginia? Would you raise your hand? Man, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tread on dangerous ground right now. And I'm only going to tell this because of the fact I'm going to rub it in on you West Virginians. The story is told, and it's a joke, and the story is told about a man who was driving down the West Virginia Turnpike. And he came to a rest area, so he pulled off into the rest area and got out, walked around a bit, then he got back in his car. When he got back in his car, he saw that there was two men working in the medium, working their way down the road. He watched them for a while. One was digging a hole, moving about 10 feet further down the road, digging a hole, moving about 10 feet down the road, digging another hole. The other man was following him, filling in the hole. He got thinking, I wonder what they're doing. Why in the world is, why, the, why in the world are they digging a hole and filling it right back up? Digging a hole and filling it back up. So these two men took a break and came over to the rest area, probably to get a drink of water or something. So he stopped them and says, what are you doing? Why are you, why are you digging a hole and the other filling it up? They said, oh, we're really a three-man team, but the guy that plants the trees is off work today. <laughs> Now, the silliness of that is they left something out, something that was important. I wonder how silly it is in the eyes of God to see people leaving things out of their Christian life that are very important. When I preached in Edible, Tennessee, we had an older woman in the congregation. <laughs> I imagine she was in her 90s. And she was quite the character. She was married five times and she got after her fifth husband with a gun one day and shot, shot at him five different times. And I, I looked at him and said, and you missed? He says, yes, I should have hit him. <laughs> That's how, how she felt. And he, he was sitting right there and he says, yeah, but she came by the close. And, and so, and my, uh, while we were there, we were baked a cake. I don't know whether any of you ever heard of the Mexican fruit cake. It is absolutely one of the most delicious cakes that you ever want to eat. But she baked a cake for one of the fellowships we had, which we call a chat and chew. And everybody loved the cake and they asked for her for a recipe. So in order to make it easy, I put the recipe in the church newsletter. No, it hadn't, was not there, so she wasn't aware of the cake itself. So she read the recipe, I'm, I'm going to try that. And the next Sunday she came to Vera and said, Vera, that was the greatest cake I've ever made and ever ate in my life. And Vera says, well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. 
Then she started. I didn't like pineapple, so I didn't put the pineapple in. I didn't have any coconut, so I didn't use that. And I didn't have this, and I changed this recipe that way. I made she made it around five or six different changes in the recipe. And then after she left, she looked at me. She said, "I don't know what kind of cake she fixed, but it wasn't the Mexican fruit cake." <laughs> now I, I, I tell that because I, I look at the religious world today, and I see that people, in my opinion, that are making changes as far as God's word is concerned. And I think that they are sincere. They are honest people. They love the Lord. That there are so many things that are missing. I firmly believe, without a shadow of a doubt in my mind, that we have not the right to change one thing in God's Word. I don't think we need to subtract anything from it, nor to add anything to it. But when we do, we change God's recipe for salvation. And we're like the people that are planting a tree without the tree planter. If we were to go through the Bible and make a list of the different things that the Bible, New Testament says are important for salvation, I think you might be surprised at the list. I, I, I've seen at least 17 different things in the list of this particular type which God uses as a necessary for our salvation. In our little scripture pamphlet that I passed out today, there are 12 that are listed. And I, I would like to go down those 12 and just read the scripture so you can see what we're talking about. The first one is found in 2 Timothy, the first chapter, verses 8 and 9, and it says, God saves. And this is what it says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoners, but be thou partakers of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us. Now I want you to notice that. Who hath saved us. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> uh, that was bothering my eyes. Um, and uh, call us, uh, and saved us and called us with a holy calling according to our works, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. The second thing that saves us, Jesus saves. I, I'd love to see those little signs on the way of the road that says Jesus saves. It's John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. The world through him, through Jesus, might be saved. We are saved by the blood of Christ. Colossians, the first chapter, verses 13 and 14. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into his kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption or salvation through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. We are saved by the name of Jesus, Acts 4, 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, but there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We are saved by the life and the death of Christ. Romans, the fifth chapter, the tenth verse. For then when we were enemies, we were reconciled by God, to God by the death of his Son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Notice that. We are saved by the grace of God. Ephesians, the second chapter of the eighth verse. And by the way, this also mentions faith. For by faith are you saved through faith. And, have, and that only yourselves, and is the gift of God. We are saved by the mercy of God. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. We are saved by the calling on the name of the Lord, Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We are saved by confessing the name of Christ, Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess